Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club. Today we start a new book entitled Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards. This book is a biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Mertie, who were both born in 1878 and led an exciting life of service and mission in the early days of the young and rapidly growing Seventh-day Adventist Church. Both the author and the main characters were well-known Adventists in their time. The former, for her numerous books and publications, speaking engagements and teaching skills, and the latter for their involvement in all aspects of church service, religious education, Bible studies, and overseas mission engagements. As we read and listen to the stories of the life of the Cottrells in this book, we realize that the early Adventists in the late 19th century and the early 20th century were on fire for Christ with a zeal and enthusiasm that is sadly lacking in the church today. At a time in history when the very prophetic reason for which we have been called as a church and a movement is happening all around us. Roy Cottrell came from a long line of preachers and his grandfather was a Sabbath keeper even before the Adventist church was founded. His lineage stretched back to the Albigenses who kept the Sabbath and among the Cottrells there were many preachers who were devoted entirely to the everlasting gospel and the love of Jesus. Roy loved to learn at his grandfather's feet and as a child he was familiar with the beast, the mark of the beast, how Sunday became the Christian day of worship, the state of the dead, and the value of keeping all of God's commandments. His life reflected Christ even as a young boy. His deportment was always respectable and his attitude sweet and endearing although he could not be moved from his beliefs and stood firmly on his biblical convictions. He met his wife Murty in his twenties when he was already an established preacher, teacher, and dean of students in various early Adventist institutions such as Mount Vernon Academy and South Lancaster Academy, which later became Atlantic Union College. Roy's uncle was Charles Taylor, who wrote the book called The Marked Bible, which has previously been featured on the last day's book club. And Roy worked or associated with such well-known Adventist names as A.G. Daniels, Uriah Butler, J.N. Andrews, the Farnsworths, and many others. He even had the privilege of being invited to the home of Ellen White before he and Murty embarked on their journey to China where they spent much of the rest of their lives in mission service. We begin our story today with chapter 1 entitled The Little White Schoolhouse. The Little White Schoolhouse down on the corner was a jewel in the setting of late autumn. Winter was so near that the reds, oranges and yellows were fading into a drab brown. The room was full of children studying. Among them was a small boy named Roy. He held his head a little higher when the classes were reciting in geography and history. For Roy knew a lot about that. He had it built into him from long evenings of happy family talk about the noble past, about men and women who would face death rather than compromise a principle. And built into him also 
was the love of freedom and the inborn realization that truth is all important. It is a pearl, a jewel to be guarded at all cost. Thanksgiving was over and gone. The air smelled like snow and the children began to talk of Christmas. That was long before the world had realized the popular market value of the manger, the stable, the three wise men, and the shepherds on the hillside. People gave presents sometimes, but it was not on the scale we see it today. The little girls made needle books by cutting pink flannel with pinking shears. And the boys made pen wipers or a snow shovel for their folks at home. You made gifts, and your folks bought you oranges and stick candy. And it was a gala occasion because of things you did not see or eat so very often. The teacher, Miss Morehouse, thought of herself as a modern teacher, and she experimented with many new methods. She capitalized on every holiday, using it as an outlet for art, oral expression, and written compositions. With Christmas in the offing, she set out with zeal to make the most of it, not realizing that she had a pupil in her room who knew a great deal about it. Geography class was held on the bench at the front of the room. Roy was right there, his blue eyes intent on all that was going on. Little girls in long, colorful calico dresses looked like big umbrellas in the dullness of the old-time schoolroom. The blackboard was cracked, and the many-paned windows were red with the rays of the westering sun. Several children looked hopefully at the clock, ticking solemnly as it dragged its feet through the long afternoon. But not Roy. This was the best, the most fascinating class of all. He was always conscious of his ancestry, and often, especially in history and geography, he could shine by repeating some exciting incident that his old grandfather had told him. The teacher's long, full skirts swept the floor. Her white blouse was high-necked, held up under her chin by little stays run into the delicate material. Boys and girls, she began importantly, her eyes gleaming. Why do we celebrate Christmas? As if the whole class had learned a piece by heart, they called out in chorus, Because Christ was born on Christmas Day. The smug, satisfied look that flitted across the teacher's face changed when Roy, intent on the question, raised his hand. Yes, Roy? Miss Morehouse, lots of people believe it was on the 25th of December, but it really couldn't have been. It must have been earlier than that. Her glance was chilly. Why did this boy have to spoil all her little dramatics? He was a good boy, and you could not be angry with him, yet he just knew too much. You could not rest easy with him around. Why so, Roy? She asked, somewhat annoyed. It's too cold out there for the shepherds to be out with their sheep much later than October. And you know, the Bible says that there were shepherds in the fields with their flocks, and the angels sang to them. Then they hurried up to the little town of Bethlehem and found the baby in a manger. The children were all looking at Roy. A puzzled look was on the teacher's face. How can that be, Roy? Surely all the civilized world can't be wrong on this. Why then do people observe Christmas? For the same reason, I suppose, that they keep Sunday, the lad 
answered laconically. One of the girls tittered. The boys nudged each other, and the teacher flushed. That has nothing to do with the matter, Roy, she said sharply. Here, she thought she was sure of her ground. Everybody knows that Christ was raised from the dead on Easter Sunday, and that is the reason we keep it. But a stubborn look came into the lad's clear eyes. She had reason to dread that look, for Roy usually knew what he was talking about and demonstrated it. But Miss Morehouse, he protested, Christ never told us to leave off keeping the Sabbath and keep Sunday. The Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath. All of the children were looking at Roy now in wonder, for the teacher was known to be well educated, and it was a novel thing for a boy of twelve to be quoting from the Bible or history so glibly. That commandment was for the Jews back in the Old Testament times, she said conclusively, as if that closed all argument. We are New Testament Christians. Still, Roy did not even look vanquished. But Miss Morehouse came the reply, very politely, yet with conviction. I know for a fact that there is no command in all the Bible for people to keep Sunday. For my grandfather was a minister and read the Bible through ever so many times. And he says he never saw it once. All right, said the teacher, a little exasperated at the turn the lesson had taken. Since you know so much about it, do tell us just how the world did come to keep Sunday. Who started it if the Lord and the disciples did not? A half smile played on her face. She had him this time, she thought, but she was mistaken. Not for nothing had Roy been an ardent admirer of his aged grandfather, Roswell Cottrell, for he loved to listen by the hour to his tales of the olden days. It was a matter of pride to this wonderful old man that the Cottrell family had been Sabbath keepers for many generations, and this had become a cherished family tradition. Even sturdy Nicholas Cottrell, who arrived to join Roger Williams in Rhode Island in 1638, eight generations ago, evidently kept the Seventh-day Sabbath in the one colony that stood for religious liberty. The boy's face cleared. He was treading on familiar ground and could tell things easily that he had heard so many times. Well, he said, appreciative of his small audience, there was an emperor of Rome whose name was Constantine. He was a pagan, that means a heathen, and he had a dream that if he put the cross on his banner, he would win all the battles. He did, and he won. Grandfather said he took up Christianity just to be grateful and to please some of his people. But he really wasn't a Christian. He wanted to make Christianity a little like his own ideas, but he didn't want to give up his old habits. So he changed the church to suit himself. And that was the day of the sun. And he made a law that the citizens should keep Sunday. So, well, Sunday keeping is a Catholic and a pagan institution. Institution, institution, jeered Emery B., who delighted in using big words. An institution is a big building like a college or a hospital. As the argument had taken a turn not exactly to the teacher's liking, she told the boys she did not want them to argue. We have taken up so much time on this discussion anyway, so we'll have to omit geography class. 
Books in order now. Get ready for recess. Big flakes of snow had started falling several hours before, and now the ground was covered and the landscape clothed in white. At such times, snowball fights often raged. A hat was knocked off by some agile contender, and the victim cried out in mock anger, Who threw that snowball? The discussion, still fresh in his mind, one of the boys shouted, Oh, that was old Constantine. The repartee brought a big laugh. That meant a change from the former nickname Roy had earned, seven by nine, because he was the only Seventh-day Adventist in the school. Now, it was changed good-naturedly to Constantine. Boys will look at the future through rose-colored spectacles. To their young eyes, life is a grand adventure, and they look forward breathlessly to the exploits ahead and talk big of what they will do and will be in the golden days ahead. Me, I aim to be an engineer and have the biggest train that runs to New York City. I don't expect to stay around here any longer than it will take me to get away, one boy bragged, tossing his head and looking disdainfully at the country surroundings. I don't see why, another of the boys remarked. I get grandpa's farm when I'm of age. And let me tell you, it is going to hum. I'm not going to farm like the rest of the old fogies who are afraid of every new idea. There's a mint of money in a farm. Such hopes and ambitions were aired by boys with restless feet and brooding eyes. What you going to do, Constantine? They asked Roy. Roy had come from a family that loved books. His was a family that had produced preachers and teachers and professors and doctors in almost every generation. He cleared his throat. I'm going to go to an academy first. Then I'm going to go to the college our church has in Battle Creek, Michigan. I want to be a teacher. Again, the boys laughed, Roy laughing with them. Yet the way he knew history, they all half believed that Roy's future was more likely to be as he dreamed it than the ones they were boasting about. Now, he had a new nickname added to 7 by 9 and Constantine. It was Professor. The name stuck until he actually went away to Mount Vernon Academy, the beginning of a dream come true. The end of chapter one. Chapter two, a descendant of the Albigenses. It was not strange that Roy was the boy he was. He often thought of the companionship he had enjoyed with Grandfather Cottrell. One hot August day, the two were resting on the east veranda of the old two-story country home. The view was almost mouth-watering. A fine apple orchard was in full view, laden with its rich, very colored fruits of many varieties. There were sweet boughs, Baldwins, Greenings, Spitzenbergs, 20-ounce Pippins, Golden Russets, and many others. The old man sat there, happily looking at the bearing trees he had helped to plant so long ago. A half-smile played on his kindly face. Roy, he said, shall I give you a riddle of an apple tree? Why, yes, Roy answered eagerly, for often the long winter evenings would be brightened by riddles, popcorn eating, and tales of other days. Since summer, was usually too busy for such leisure, Roy welcomed the diversion happily. Well, here it is. My dear old father once set out an apple tree. The first year it bore apples, and he saw them with his eyes. The next year it bore fruit, but not apples. 
He saw it, but not with his eyes. The boy grew wide-eyed and looked long at the loved old face crinkling with fun. You're joking me, Grandpa. No, I'm not. That is a true riddle. Roy could not think of anything to guess, though he racked his small brain loath to give up. But at length, he was compelled to do so. With a twinkle in his kindly eyes, Grandfather gave the answer. During the first year, the tree bore two apples, and my father saw them with his eyes. The next year, there was only one apple on the young tree. And during that year, my father had become blind in one eye, so he did not see it with his eyes. They both laughed at the sequel, and the thought of his father started grandfather on tales of Cottrell history so far back that Roy had to strain his imagination to dream of those people centuries ago who bore the same name as he did. He wondered about them and their home in the southeastern part of France and the terrible sufferings they endured because they would not follow the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. They were called Albigenses, and nearby was another group of true followers who would not indulge in the sins of an apostate church. They were the Waldenses. Roy was glad to hear that his great-great-great-great-grandfather was a Seventh-day Baptist, and that the true Sabbath had been kept for centuries by his first ancestors. The birthplace of Roy Cottrell was in the western part of the state of New York on what is called the Ridge Road. This natural wonder is close to 80 miles in length and runs in a zigzag course, averaging along its length a distance of about 8 to 10 miles from the south shore of Lake Ontario. The very contour of the road and the surrounding country made it plain that the Ridge Road was once the shoreline of the beautiful lake. This locality, with soil most fertile and productive, has often been called the Garden of the World. Roy's father, unlike his rugged, hardy grandfather, was slightly under average size and was not strong or well. The family, with grandmother and grandfather Cottrell, lived in the rambling old farmhouse which had been their home for many years. Because of his ill health, Father Cottrell could not follow the tradition and enter the ministry. He became instead a market gardener. But Grandfather? No one could outshine noble Grandfather Roswell F. Cottrell, who stood six feet two inches tall in his stocking feet, and in his prime tipped the scales at a little over 200 pounds. Roy was proud of him, now in the sunset of his grand life, for he had seen much of the beginnings of the remnant church. As a young man, Roswell believed firmly in the coming of the Lord, but he put no trust in the 1844 preaching of William Miller, for a definite reason. The generations of Sabbath-keeping gave him an insight few men possessed at the time. He naturally reasoned that if the Millerites were correct, they would be keeping all the commandments of God. All through the book of Revelation, those who would be accepted of the great God were pointed out they would be true commandment keepers. But the Millerites were observing the papal Sunday or rest day, the venerable day of the sun. He was not at all surprised when the Lord did not come in October of 1844, as had been fondly hoped. Roswell Cottrell, full of years, content, and waiting for the coming of the Lord, used to sit in his old creaking armchair and tell the delighted Roy tales of the early days of the movement, as he loved to call it. He had a large supply 
of fascinating memories. The boy never tired of the story of the families moving to Millgrove, New York, or of the doughty old Joseph Bates, the sea captain who had fought pirates, gone through storms and shipwrecks on the high seas, and later, with his inimitable personality and sturdy courage, helped to pilot the infant church through the turbulent waters of its early history. Grandfather would become so thrilled by the tales he was telling that the boy almost believed he actually saw them, though they had happened years before he was born. He could almost see the very place on the porch where Captain Bates loved to sit, and how with his piercing eyes and old square-rimmed glasses, he could almost look straight through you. Years before, Captain Bates had been up in New Hampshire and had there learned the truth of the Seventh-day Sabbath from a woman as doughty as he. She had attended the White Church in Washington, New Hampshire one Sunday morning. After the communion service that day, she shook hands with the minister at the door. I almost spoke right out in the meeting, she told him. When he asked her why, she told him that when he said no one should partake of the sacred emblems of bread and wine, if he did not keep all of the commandments, she wanted to say that the minister himself ought not to partake of it, for he did not keep the Sabbath. She seemed very sure of her convictions. But good Pastor Frederick Wheeler was an honest man. When he heard that remark, he did not simply think, oh, this is just a sharp-tongued woman. He investigated, and within a few weeks, the pastor and his congregation became the first Seventh-day Adventist church in the world. There on the wall was the rusted nail where Elder Bates was fond of hanging his beloved charts while he unfolded the mysteries of Daniel and the Revelation. How could anyone question such a presentation? It was strikingly clear that it was based upon Bible truth. The people were impressed and convinced. With such magnificent stories to hear, no wonder the boy Roy had high aspirations and was happy to be called Constantine, seven by nine, and professor. Money was scarce in those days, even though the earth gave forth her fruits in abundance. It seemed for a while that Roy's dream of furthering his education might come to nothing. But one thing was in his favor. Early in life, he determined to be strong in the faith, as were the Cottrells for many generations. To be strong, as was his mother, who when she was but 14 years of age, was willing to leave her childhood home rather than renounce her beliefs. The End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Mount Vernon Academy Of his early life and experiences, Roy has written, Aunt May Taylor Quanta, who frequently visited our home, was a pioneer missionary to India. Another welcome visitor was Uncle Charles L. Taylor, who afterward wrote that thrilling book, The Marked Bible. Counting my mother, that was three of eleven children reared in a home where the mother was an agnostic and the father a spiritualist. How I thank God that mother had the indomitable courage to see light and to embrace it fearlessly, for in faith and courage she was one with the Cottrells into which family she married. I know now why her eyes gleamed when tales were told at the fireside of the terrible persecutions of the Dark Ages and the heroism of our forebears revealed in the face of death. She knew what they were talking about. They were speaking her language. It was fun when Aunt May came. She was a positive character and kept things very lively on every visit. Not long before she left for India, she visited us. I was an unsophisticated country boy, studious, yet one 
who love the woods, the streams, and the great out of doors. I watched and listened as she told of her preparations to sail for India. Would I ever have the joy of seeing China, Japan, or India? I wondered. I did not say much, but I truly adored her. One day, she turned to me suddenly and spoke earnestly in her own quick, winsome way. Roy, you should be in one of our church schools. I heartily agreed with her, she continued. I have to be in Battle Creek for a few weeks before I sail. How would you like it if I try to secure your place where you can work for your room and board while you attend the college? If she had asked me how I would like to have the contents of a national bank, I could not have been more astonished and elated. I confess, I did not sleep much that night, for the fever of excitement thrilled my soul. Battle Creek? Who did not desire to see Battle Creek? And to go to school? Why, the very thought of it filled me with a kind of breathless ecstasy. I heard the crickets and the little night creatures in their endless symphony nearly all night. But I was not listening to their medley. I was busy picturing myself, walking with dignity, with an armful of books up the steps of the big square three-story building, which was the mecca of my dreams, Battle Creek College. The dream was important. Even though Aunt May, busy preparing for her mission service, could not secure a place for Roy. Places were hard to find, for many boys came to Battle Creek looking for just such a situation. Eagerly, Roy haunted the mailbox, but when the letter came, his disappointment was great. No suitable place could be found. For some days, Roy was a bit disheartened, but all things must end, and soon he began to regain his cheerful spirit. A year passed, yet the time was far from wasted. A new teacher, remarkably capable and understanding, had been chosen as teacher of the upper room in the little white schoolhouse down on the corner. She went the second mile and took a real interest in the students. She inspired them with worthy ideals and to Roy's delight, taught several high school subjects. She urged the older students to take the Regents examination at the Medina Union Academy and offered prizes to encourage her boys and girls to study and achieve. Roy won the highest award for scholarship. After this, he felt much better about his disappointment, for the year saw him starting on the high school program and tremendously excited about the business of getting an education. Such subjects as civics, algebra, and classical literature demanding hard study and concentration simply whetted his appetite for more. But that year, an important event occurred which was to change the course of Roy's life. The Ohio Conference of Seventh-day Adventists established a school called Mount Vernon Academy. Professor W. T. Bland was the principal, but that was not as significant to Roy as who would be the Bible teacher. It turned out to be his mother's brother, Charles L. Taylor. Uncle Charles was an enthusiastic man, and in his genial way, he encouraged his nephew to attend Mount Vernon Academy. But the barrier was the lack of the $140 needed to pay for a year's room, board, and tuition. That amount does not seem large now, but in those times, men worked for a dollar a day and were glad to obtain employment. Now, Roy was determined to surmount the insurmountable. And to one of such grim determination, obstacles may become stepping stones. Boy-like, he had been interested in all sorts of new things. One was a bicycle. This was before the days of the safety bicycle. The ones he saw displayed in stores had a huge front wheel and a smaller back wheel. They were far from safe, as many a boy found out to his sorrow. The back wheel was so much lighter than the front that often when the rider started down a steep hill or reached a rough path, 
the rear wheel would bounce up into the ear and precipitate a dangerous header. Many a lad literally ran over himself and suffered broken bones, lacerations, and painful contusions from a disastrous forward plunge. Roy and his cousin Wesley decided to buy one of these high wheels, taking turns at riding it while learning the art. Wesley took just such a header into a muddy pond. Roy ran to his rescue, and while he was helping his drenched and angry cousin out of the muddy water and pulling the bicycle to safety, Wesley cried out, I'm finished with that thing, Roy. You make me an offer for my part of it, and it's yours. I'll sell out cheap. Roy was pleased, and after a few minutes bargaining, he found himself the sole owner of a new bicycle, which he could use for business as well as pleasure. He found it tremendously useful in obtaining work on farms and gardens in that vicinity and for running errands here and there. While he was thus employed, his uncle's letters began to come, urging him to attend the fine new academy in Ohio. As he cast about in his mind for means of obtaining the necessary money, he thought of selling church literature. The little book called Gospel Primer by James Edson White had just been published and was attractively illustrated. By this time, Roy had the bicycle under good control and knew its erratic ways well. And it took him far afield, selling the little red book to the town and country people in his vicinity. Yet, money accumulated tantalizingly slow. By the time school opened in September, he had only half the amount he needed. Even so, it was amazing in those days for so much to be earned in just a few short weeks. While he was wondering if he could step out by faith, unexpected encouragement came. An uncle in New York, as if his going were a foregone conclusion, sent him the money for his train fare to Mount Vernon Academy. It seemed to be an answer from heaven. Yet, this was not the only worry. During these years, Roy's father, who had never been healthy, was ill much of the time. Money was scarce indeed, so scarce that there was hardly enough to provide some of the actual necessities. Roy was exceedingly loath to leave home when he was so acutely needed. His father, weak and ailing, could hardly bear to see him go. Son, he said earnestly, I don't see how we can spare you, for you are the main support of the family. I wish you could go to Mount Vernon, but it doesn't seem possible to me. Looking upon his father's anxious face, Roy's heart sank. But mother, strong in faith, was willing to sacrifice anything in order that her boy might obtain a Christian education. Her courage kindled her husband's faith, and by the time Roy was to leave, the way seemed clear. Uncle Charles had written that he had found a position for Roy where he could work for his room and board. With that help, his money would be enough. With a heart full of thanksgiving, he made preparations to go. Mother packed a good lunch for the trip. Even the ride was a great adventure to the boy, for he must change trains at Buffalo and again at Cleveland. Of course, Uncle Charles was at the Mount Vernon station to meet him and to conduct him proudly to the new institution of learning. The next day, Roy took his $70 to the business office and paid his year's tuition in full, the huge sum of $31 and 25 cents. Then, after purchasing the needed books and supplies, he wisely deposited the remainder of the money in the office so that he could draw on it whenever he needed it. The town was not crowded around the academy campus then as it is today, and Roy was directed across woodland and field to a farm about a mile distant where he was to work for his board and room. One of his chores was to milk six cows morning and evening, 
a job that called him out of his warm bed long before daylight. But he was so eager to learn that with the sound of the alarm clock, he was out on the floor, pulling on his heavy work clothes before his tired body could do too much protesting. He thought he had worked hard while at home, but now there were simply not enough hours in the day to accomplish what he desired. From morning to night, it was rush, rush to work, rush to his studies, and rush to his classes at the school a mile distant. The people for whom he worked were pleasant and friendly. Life to them was a strenuous grind, yet they faced it with cheerful hearts. The food he ate was good, filling and nourishing, but he became lean and worn from racing here and there. He wondered idly once, as he sped across Hill and Dale to the academy in time for his first class, what people did who were not half so busy. As much as he enjoyed his classes and the association with teachers and young people, he could not help looking forward to the month of June when he could go back home to enjoy his mother's wonderful cooking and a little respite from the strenuous program he was following. Then he would settle down to a summer of work. As to what that work would be, he had not fully decided, but it was soon marked out for him. Before the spring term closed, a rousing literature evangelism rally was held, and Roy succumbed to the fever again, heartened by his success of the previous summer. Here, in these enthusiastic classes, he learned of many things he should not do. He learned the best way to approach people and a number of little niceties he had not dreamed of before. He was filled with enthusiasm. With the Lord's help, I can probably earn enough to stay in the dormitory if I follow what these men say about successful salesmanship, he said to himself. I don't mind milking cows, but I do need a little more time with Bible literature, math, and other excursions into knowledge. On the train home, he studied the prospectus he was to use. It described the wonderful book, The Prophecies of Jesus by J.G. Mattison. He memorized the suggested approaches that had been presented at the rally. By the time he reached home, he was in fine spirits and eager to begin the task. It was good to be with his loved ones again. They had much to talk about. He took out his worn wallet and showed them its contents. After a whole year at school, he still had a dollar thirty-eight of the original money he had taken with him. Pretty fine, my boy, his father told him, and mother showed pride and approval in her shining eyes. Roy was now full of plans for the future. He could hardly settle down to the brief period of leisure he had fondly anticipated. He must be up and at his task. He knew by now that the rich plums of success seldom fall into your lap unless you shake the tree vigorously. So, out of its winter storage place, the old high-wheel bicycle was again brought, and it was oiled and put into service. He helped his parents on Sundays, but he was out on the road many hours each weekday, canvassing for the fine, inspiring book. Success crowned his efforts, and he placed many copies in the homes south of Lake Ontario. One day, he was showing his prospectus to a couple who were hardly versed in the history of the United States, much less that of the world or of Reformation times. Roy could hardly fathom that, for he had fairly cut his teeth on stories of persecution in the Dark Ages and the centuries that followed. When he was waxing eloquent on the bravery of young Martin Luther in burning the papal bull of excommunication, the farmer blurted out his disapproval. Burned it, did he? he exclaimed. Such a waste. I ain't got no patience with such fellas. Why didn't they butcher it and eat it? Roy was inwardly convulsed with mirth, but he kept his poise. Yet it was difficult to convince this practical-minded farmer that there were other bulls in history quite as important as the bovine species that snorted and poured in the ground in the back pasture. No sale there, but he did sell books all over that locality. By September, he was back at good old Mount Vernon Academy in the boys' dormitory, 
no longer domiciled in an upstairs room of a farmhouse a mile through the woods. It was a luxury, even to think that he might sleep until the rising bell announced the dawn of another day. In room four, he set up his accoutrements for a busy year. His roommate was the now well-known Henry Miller, who was later to make his mark with the Qian Kai-shek administration of China, with the health food industry of America, and to receive honors which might be coveted by any truly great man. The original Mount Vernon Academy building had formerly been a sanitarium, a long L-shaped structure. It was stately in appearance and housed all the departments of the school. One day, as workmen were repairing the tarred roof, a fire broke out on the third floor near the partition which separated the two dormitories. Both boys and girls appeared on the scene with fire extinguishers. For a few minutes, tremendous excitement prevailed, for the whole school might easily burn down. But the flames were soon under control. Even so, for many hours, the dense smoke filled the corridors. In the Seventh-day Adventist schools of those days, the moral standings regarding the association of young men and women were very strict, and some of the young people took advantage of the confusion surrounding the fire fighting to get a word or two in edgewise with the objects of their admiration. Naturally, this breach of school etiquette should be handled with dispatch in the next day's chapel exercise. Principal W.T. Bland told a student group that during the confusion of the fire, he had overheard, yes, actually overheard, part of a sentimental conversation between a young man and a young lady. He appeared much surprised and disturbed. Then he launched into a speech of the evils of note writing. Now he stated, if there's any young person here who just cannot stop this evil habit, let him raise his hand and the faculty will give the needed help. He stood back and smugly looked over his audience. Complete silence prevailed. To his surprise, Roy raised his hand. The whole school gasped. The astonished professor asked, What is that, Mr. Cottrell? Can't you stop note writing? No, sir, was the quiet reply. And why not? came the stern query. Because I haven't begun it. Roy answered timidly, sorry now that he had made a spectacle of himself. The students roared with laughter, and the tension of the moment was lifted. Even the austere Professor Bland could hardly suppress a smile. The chapel exercises came to an abrupt close. Roy carried the keys to the storeroom and lockers, and was in charge of provisions and supplies to the kitchen. One afternoon in December, an estimable young lady who had been skating in Hiawatha Park, took the shortcut through the kitchen on the way to her room. As she stopped to talk with Roy, the Dean of Women appeared on the scene and ordered her to her room. But that was not all. A few hours later, Roy was summoned to the principal's office and told that it was not best for him to continue in his present work, that he should surrender the keys to the matron, purchase an axe, and joined the boys who were cutting stove wood by the cord in the nearby forest. It was a bitter pill, which Roy considered unjust. But those were the days when boys and girls were not supposed to even speak to each other except in the most conventional times and places. Sometimes trials and temptations have a way of coming in peers, and so it was then. During the previous summer, an agnostic relative visited the Cottrell home in New York. With subtle wisecracks, he scoffed and ridiculed various statements of scripture. At the time, Roy passed them off as silly and absurd. But now, when things were going a bit hard at school, those cunning phrases of doubt fastened in his mind and made him extremely unhappy. Whether he was at work or study, they haunted him until he began to consider quitting school. I must do something, he told himself. This crisis must be solved. And because his life had been built on a firm foundation, he remembered Nicholas Cottrell eight generations before, who would leave his country rather than give up his faith. 
He thought of John Cottrell, whose integrity was legendary in the Cottrell family. Of Roswell Cottrell, who did right the moment he saw light, and who cherished the memories of many generations of Cottrells who faced death rather than deny the Lord. In the middle of the night, Roy slipped quietly out of his bed, not disturbing his sleeping roommate. Donning a robe, he stepped out into the corridor and down into one of the dark classrooms. The moon made pale parallelograms of light on the floor. Things were so still that Roy began to feel a strange peace steal into his troubled heart. And because he had always been taught to go to the Lord, he fell upon his knees. Here, he could pray aloud and call upon the Lord to help him. O oh Lord, he cried out in the agony of his young soul, if you actually exist, and if there is a God in heaven, if there is a heaven, take away these doubts. I cannot help myself. Take away the terrible thoughts of unbelief and doubt. Give me peace, O oh Lord. Give me peace. Then, like the voice of God coming to crowd out the confusion, these words came clearly into his mind. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Roy knew now what it meant more than ever when David cried out, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I could not sin against thee. After half an hour of communion with him, whom to know is life eternal, Roy found sweet rest and deliverance. Peace flooded his soul. He looked out of the window to the quiet campus. What had seemed to him terrible a while ago, a place from which he must escape, was now lovely in the whiteness of the snow and the penciled outlines of the bare trees. Joy filled his heart, and he hurried back to his room. Roy slept soundly, and as morning dawned, he seemed to have entered upon a new era in life. A few days later, he tried to think of the jibes and the expressions of contempt that had almost made shipwreck of his life, but he could not even recall them. The evil thoughts of doubt were gone forever, and victory was complete. The End of the First Reading of this book, Pioneers Together, and we're reading the chapter in Mount Vernon Academy.